Hello, everybody. I am back here by the time I've given a presentation before on the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and International Safeguards. And this presentation is about one of the very, the most current topics in the International Safeguards uh, System and um, something that the IAEA has been working very closely with state systems of accounting and control. Um, by now, I understand that this would be one of the very l final lectures because um, it's basically, it's a topic that is very current, so it should, you, sh you all should have a very good understanding of, of the whole system. And as we approach this subject, um, the, 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 the concern, the, the understanding of policy and technical should make, should be a little easier for you now. Um, so let's talk about the increasing role of state systems, and I would also include regional systems of accounting and control of nuclear materials uh, for international safeguards. So I showed this slide in my previous presentation on the non-proliferation treaty just to get started and remind you about what are the objectives of international safeguards. And they are to deter the diversion of nuclear materials from peaceful use by maximizing the risk of early detection and to provide assurance to the international community of the commitments made by these, uh, uh, these states, these member states, uh, regarding the non-proliferation treaty and the international safeguards agreements that they uh, are required to sign with the IAEA um, as member uh, uh, states, of, uh, as signatories of the NPT. So we have the technical objective, mainly focusing on providing assurance, which would be, in my understanding, a political objective. Today, the system, the international safeguard system, relies on the declaration by the member state of, to the IEA and independent verification by the IEA on these declarations. One declares what they have and the other verifies. There has to be a very close connection in this communication line. And this is what the, the the way that we are approaching the international safeguard system now. Uh, we are tying this communication, this cooperation with the IAEA very tightly. Uh, and it, ha it is either between the state and the IAEA or with between the regional system and the IAEA. Now the state, we, we have three levels here of, of um, responsibilities. Uh, and sometimes the state level and the SSAC level or regional system kind of overlap. But in most cases, you have the state responsibilities. And these would be the head of states, those that actually make the sign off uh, the agreement and, 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 and take responsibility for the country. And these are expressed in, still in the international safeguards area through their Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, or the IMSIRC 153, and uh, the IMSIRC 66 Revision 2 type agreements. Remember those countries that are not signatories of the NPT, like India, Pakistan, Israel. Um, these countries are verified by the IAEA uh, based on uh, certain facilities are verified by the IAEA. So, 66 focuses on activities and facilities, as opposed to 153 focus on full scope of, uh, and comprehensive of their program. Uh, the state responsibility is mainly to establish and maintain a system of accounting for and control of nuclear materials. This is called upon, this is specified in paragraph seven of IMSIRC 153. And the reason why this is a state ob uh, uh, obligation is, is obvious. You have to have all the laws and regulations in place to welcome uh, a, a foreign and international verification system. 
Continuing with the state responsibilities, um, there has to be a, a series of processes implemented and agreed upon uh, uh, and enforced to provide the accountability and control of, of nuclear material processes. Uh, there has to be a strong commitment um, to report those activities. And here we are talking about production of nuclear material, uh, um, uh, processes, design information uh, of facilities. So it, it, it has to be a very high level of commitment for a, a sovereign state to pass on this information to an international organization that will come and verify. And that's why it's at such a high level of responsibility. Same thing with the declarations. They have to be accurate, complete, and timely. And the only level that can provide that assurance is the very higher level of the state. Uh, it's, we're not talking operators here. We're talking state level, those decision makers. Uh, they're the ones who establish uh, and facilitate um, transferring information uh, to, to outside. And most and uh, uh, most important of all is to allow, provide the means for an uh, international organization to come into your country to verify those activities declared. And I mentioned before, one of the examples of this is to allow visa expedition. And it has to be timely, it has to be uh, um, uh, for an extended period of time, um, but it's just any measure that allows these individuals, these, very, these inspectors, to come into the country, that has to be at the state level of responsibility. Now, when one of the responsibilities of the state was to establish a state system of accounting and control. Um, in several situations, the, the state system and the state, the representatives of these two, uh, they kind of, they're, they're almost the same people. So when, when we talk to an individual from uh, the SSAC, uh, this individual has been uh, blessed by its government to be able to talk on behalf uh, of, of, that gov of that country, of that government, in, t in, in matters related to nuclear material accountancy and control. So what are the SSAC obligations and responsibilities? Uh, they should be, they're responsible for uh, issuing licenses um, to possess and to use the process licenses for the operator to, to, uh, to, to work and to produce. Um, they're, they are responsible for the state's nuclear material accountancy system. So the, in, in other words, the operator of the facilities will report to the SSAC who will be responsible to verify that information, to verify that information. Um, the SSAC is also responsible for nuclear security, also responsible for expert control of both nuclear material and technology, and also to investigate the unauthorized use of nuclear materials and activities. So the responsibility of the state is, of the SSAC is tremendous. It all starts, if, if all of this information is accurate and timely uh, uh, passed on from the operator to the, to the SSAC, we could say that there, all of the information that the agency needs is available. The more complete and the more accurate this information, the better, right? What more? They have more responsibilities. now. What I presented before was their internal responsibilities. They also have the responsibilities in communicating with the agency. And they in do this interface by being the sole point of contact of the IEA in that country. So that's when I mentioned that usually the, the, the representative that speaks on behalf of the SSAC is also the representative that speaks on behalf of the country of the member state with the IAEA. So in most cases, this individual wears uh, these two hats. Um, I mentioned before about the provision of timely and accurate uh, reports. Uh, 
So the more close communication that the SSAC has with the operator to obtain this information, the more timely and accurate these reports will go to the agency. So we're establishing a three-leg connection now, operator, SSAC, and the IEA. Um, the SSAC is responsible to interface with the IEA in all matters uh, regarding coordination of the inspection, inspections and of complementary access. I believe I mentioned in my uh, previous presentation that everything is documented in paper uh, and it seems very s simple, simplistic when you say, oh, the agency will verify this and that and the, I, the, the state will de de uh, declare this and that. But there's a lot of coordination that takes place prior to uh, inspection, prior to uh, agreeing on what to inspect. This is a constant coordination between SSAC and the IAEA. And that's what it means by facilitating inspections. It's not only the day of the inspector that the inspector goes, uh, they'll make sure that the door is open. It's more than that. It's agreeing from the very beginning on what will be inspected, uh, what, how long this inspection will take, uh, what are the instrumentation that will need to be used. All of that is very closely coordinated. Um, the SSAC interfacing with the IEA also serves as uh, uh, to resolve issues. Uh, the closer this collaboration, the communication will be more clear and uh, there will be no uh, um, minimizing the issues involved in, in, in any uh, uh, miscalculation or, or inspection um, uh, verification activities. And also uh, provide other relevant safeguards information. Now, when, when we've mentioned this other relevant safeguard, uh, other safeguards relevant information, we're going on to the voluntary basis here. And, and I think this is what this concept of the, that leads to the state level approach uh, is, is the beauty of it, uh, is calling upon states to understand the importance of providing additional information, a voluntary information on their systems. And we'll see why this is so important. Um, the IAEA acknowledges that there is a tremendous diversity of SSACs, and this is obvious. I mean, you have countries with uh, small nuclear fuel cycles, intermediate, no nuclear fuel cycle whatsoever. They have one research reactor. Uh, others have, have it all. Uh, so this phrase here that one size does not fit all is, is, is obvious. Uh, you have to adjust your approach for each process that you have, for each country that you're dealing with. They are different and uh, we're not talking only, I would even go beyond the technical merit of the situation. I would go to understand the culture of these countries as well. Um, in most cases, we, we have confusion in translation of, of, of terms. Uh, so what, what in some countries may be uh, a, part, a, a micro particle analysis, in others can be confused like particle analysis. And they are totally different things. So you ha there is a lot of, of, of uh, understanding and, and fitting that needs to take place when uh, this new concept um, is, is going to be uh, implemented. So uh, this, the SSAC has to be designed by the country based on its nuclear interests, production, nuclear energy production, and also on the safeguards that will apply to this safeguards, to this enterprise. Um, and as I said, depending on what type of activities you have, uh, the more regulations uh, or less. It, it, it depends on, on, on uh, each country's program, nuclear program. One of the questions that we, um, we've been asked 
uh, to think about is where does, what, where does the state system and the regional system come into place? So we talked about the state system being easy to understand in most cases because it comes from the state level, state system, and the IEA. Um, the regional system is a step between the state system and the IEA. Um, does this duplicate the activities? Um, does it represent an extra burden on the countries that are members of this regional system? All of these questions, and how much does the agency recognize or acknowledge the effort of the regional system to minimize inspections in the state? So all of these questions are asked on a current basis. This, this is what I'm presenting to you here is something that is very current and, and the international safeguards community is addressing these, uh, these uh, questions um, uh, frequently. So I am not going to answer the question, to be honest, uh, because I, I don't think I should be giving you the, uh, uh, the, uh, my opinion about it, uh, and, and I would like to, to protect, uh, to safeguard myself from, from this responsibility. But there are benefits, and there are issues, or questions that have to be resolved. Uh, one of the, one of the, the, the benefits is of, of having a regional system is exactly what I mentioned about the cultural uh, problem. Uh, well, it's not a problem, it's a, the cultural uh, issue. Um, regional systems, as the name implies, they are right there on the spot. They don't need to fly across the Atlantic. They don't need to have you know, so many hours of jet lag to catch up with. Uh, they can be right on the spot if they need to. Um, in, that, in following that, they can resolve issues in their own language. Um, they have con uh, 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 access to, um, they know the, the staff, the personnel involved. Um, so those are mainly the, the, the positive side of it. The negative side, um, I, I think I, I, I the, the only one that, that I could really think of being negative is the fact that it's one extra, um, one extra level between, uh, of reporting. So the state, m the member states of this regional system must be very committed to report to this, to this organization and uh, know that it will be inspected twice uh, by the IEA and by this regional system. The inspection process of regional system to on the SSD state and of the IEA is something that's also negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the IEA uh, has in its agreements with these regional systems that they will acknowledge the safeguards system implemented by these regional systems and therefore take into account the findings of these um, safeguard system, regional safeguard systems. Um, but as I said, everything is coordinated on almost on a case by case basis. The amount of inspections, how much can the agency uh, um, uh, take into account the results of the, the uh, regional systems. So this, this coordination is, is also, so I, I just mentioned this because uh, regional systems exist. Um, we have a bilateral system in South America, which is ABAC, and we have uh, the European system, which is ERATUM, and they conduct their inspections into the member states on a very regular basis. Um, it, it's very intense because I worked for a BAC and, and, and the, the effort is, is, is quite uh, heavy. Uh, the inspection effort is quite heavy. The, 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 the coordination between the regional system and the IEA has to be very 
carefully coordinated, uh, um, orchestrated, so that you don't transfer all the burden of these inspections over to the state system. So let's move on a little bit. I, I just made a, opened a parenthesis here to, to give you the idea of what is the state system and the regional system. But we're still talking about reporting, uh, communicating, uh, transferring declarations, and so forth. So one of the things that the IAEA recognizes that the SSAC has to be fit for a purpose is the fact that they have a document, they issued a document in 2007, and I believe this document is being upgraded, is being um, up updated um, uh, to be published very, uh, again, recently, uh, soon, I mean. So this is the milestone in the development of a national infrastructure for nuclear power. This document is being used, for example, by um, Southeast Asian countries that we call the so-called newcomers states that are engaging in a nuclear uh, power program now. Uh, so they have, they, they are adjusting and, and upgrading or just making their SSAC fit their new reality. And these topics here, that, that these bullets that I list, are some of the considerations that are listed in this milestones document in which this, these countries, uh, um, the, the, the Arab states countries, like the, the United Arab Emirate Arabs, um, uh, Vietnam, um, Philippines and, and, and these countries, they are looking into this, this document to, to it, it, it doesn't teach you how, doesn't teach these countries how to implement this, their SSACs because one of the things that I state frequently is that it, it, each country is, sovereign state, is a sovereign state and therefore should be able to know what are the measures that they will have to put in place. However, these, this document highlights those suggestions that need to be in place. How these countries are coming about to put this in the package, it's their decision. So, uh, this document outlines the considerations for the development of SSACs as nuclear energy is developed and implemented in a state. As I mentioned, the newcomer states are looking very closely to this document. Uh, it adjusts the organization and functional responsibility of the SSAC as the program proceeds in these countries. So it helps them or it assists these countries to have a, 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 a organized line of thought as they grow uh, and, and what needs to be expanded and what needs to be replaced uh, um, as their nuclear program expands. Um, in the, through this milestones document, it states that uh, a country, a state, should provide early information to the IEA on plans related to, nuclear f to the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, any research efforts regarding uh, uh, um, nuclear uh, material, uh, location where this nuclear material be may be used, and information on export and import of materials and items subject to relevant safeguards agreements. The impact of all of this SS, uh, strengthening of the SSAC to the IEA system is tremendous. I mean, if you enhance co talks, if you enhance uh, uh, coordination between two individuals, you minimize a lot of noise. Right? Misunderstandings. And this is what we are focusing here. We're trying to make each side understand what their responsibilities are and what the benefits of this close communication will bring to them. So the impact on the IAEA of this, uh, uh, of the increasing role of the SSACs is, or are, um, to expand the quality, uh, to expand the quality and capacity of, uh, and capability of the SSAC. Um, the more, 
how can I explain this? Uh, uh, the more transparent the state information is passed to the IEA, the better the IEA can adjust the level of, of verification and what to verify in, in a country. Um, it won't have to have a whole verification process because you have already provided more of the information to them. Uh, and, the de and it also influences the degree and level of cooperation between the IEA in terms of uh, do we need to talk to you on a frequent basis? How, how constant uh, uh, do I need to, to, uh, to have these collaborate co coordination meetings? It, it, it just builds on confidence uh, between the state and the IEA, which will, the ultimate goal is the so-called state level approach, which is a result from the overall efforts to strengthen the safeguard system. When you look into a state level approach, as, as the name implies, you are considering all of the features and regulations and measures and controls, processes that a state has in place and that they report this to the agency. The agency, therefore, with all of this information, may be able to m take conclusions and come to, a, 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 and come to a, a decision of perhaps not doing a, a five inspections in that certain facility. Maybe two inspections will be sufficient. And during these two inspections, maybe they don't need to do all those uh, um, non-destructive assay measures or, uh, um, or, or, or just a, a camera or remote monitoring would be sufficient. So the more information shared, the better prepared the IEA is to make this judgment, this assessment. So what are the benefits of this enhanced cooperation between the SSAC and the IEA for the state? We're going to see state and IEA. So the benefits for the state are increased transparency regarding the peaceful use. The state is very much interested in showing to the international community its peaceful intentions of the nuclear, uh, of its nuclear program. Increased international confidence in the IEA's annual safeguards conclusions. Because of the number one transparency, transparency uh, uh, interest, the more transparent, the, more, the better and more solid the IEA conclusions will be. Reduce safeguards impacts on nuclear facility operators. This is, a, this is a, one of the most important and, uh, um, benefits for the state. Uh, when you have an inspect, inspection in one of the facilities, that means that you are disturbing, maybe it, the, disturbing is a, a strong word, but in, you, you are just interfering with the everyday routine of that facility. Um, one way or another, an operator will have to stop doing what he's doing so that the agency can come and verify. Um, if you minimize that impact of safeguards inspections, that would be tremendously benefit, uh, beneficial to, uh, to the state and to the operator. It will obviously reduce cost to the state because if you're minimizing the, the um, safeguards impact, you are obviously minimizing people to say the, I mean, people is just one cost to, that has to be uh, um, working with the agency or accompanying or, or making sure that all of the information is there available. Uh, it supports domestic and international nuclear material management requirements. It supports the implementation of the state level approach, which as I mentioned, is something that is, should be the ultimate goal of, of, of both state and uh, IEA, and avoid dupli unnecessary duplication of effort. Um, duplication of effort is a topic that is very much uh, um, discussed between regional systems and the IEA. And if you, for obvious reasons, if you have the regional system 
verifying the state system, and you have the IEA verifying the state system, there, there is obviously a lot of chances of duplication there. So that's what I mentioned. The coordination between regional and the IEA has to be very, very fine tuned because you want to avoid this duplication of efforts by all means because in the end it will impact the operator uh, production. What are the benefits for the IEA in this enhanced collaboration with the, with the state system? Well, first of all, it increases the credibility of the conclusion, of the safeguards conclusion, on that specific state. The more information you have, the more uh, uh, out there the information, more accurate, more, more substance the IEA has to, to, make, its, to take, make its final conclusions. Um, it also optimizes the use of inspection resources. So if you are not inspecting too much or more than you should, you obviously, you obviously bring your, your inspection costs of travel and per diem and so forth down. Um, well, therefore, the overall costs are, are, are controlled also. Uh, the cooperation between both uh, IEA and the SSAC uh, feeds into what the agency calls their information-driven safeguards, which is all the information that is safeguards relevant, uh, addition or given on a voluntary basis that can uh, um, benefit the, 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 the conclusions, safeguards conclusions um, on a specific state. And of course, establish therefore the more information the more material, the more substance you have to establish the state's level approach. Now how do we come about accomplishing this? Uh, everything is very nice on paper, everybody's willing to collaborate with each other, but when it comes to what needs to be done, that's, that's when um, you know, some questions start to arise, and especially the provision of information. So, provision of information beyond requirements. Uh, it's beautifully said, then done. Um, providing information on expanded declarations um, and, uh, and advanced information on facilities is, is a little sensitive for some countries. Uh, it is the ideal situation, and in most cases it can be done, and it is done. Uh, on a voluntary basis because countries, as I said, they have a strong benefit in providing that. But there's also that political trade-off that some members, uh, that some countries uh, raise. And uh, these are, for example, uh, why am I going to give more information to, to you it, not knowing if you are going to really consider that information in my benefit? So there's, there's a lot of, uh, s there's still some skepticism with regards to what will be the use of this or the benefit of this additional information if I give it to you or if I stay on what is required for me and work with the IA the best way possible. Uh, but in, in the real ideal world, providing information addition beyond the requirements would be one of the ideas of how to accomplish this state level approach. Um, support the development of more effective and efficient safeguards uh, um, technologies and, and, and measurements and, and equipment. Um, hosting field trials. Uh, there's a number of new technologies that are being developed that need to be tested in a real facility operating environment so that the technology developers know what are the downfalls of, of such new system. Um, if, and, and this is again complicated for the state. I mean, that means that they again have to negotiate with the operator to stop what they're doing or even work around their routine work to welcome a group of people because this is always more than one person, 
uh, to bring in some a, a technology to test in their operating environment. Um, this is something that has to be coordinated. It is ideal. It is very useful to host field trials because you test new systems aiming at minimizing inspection efforts, uh, but it is a, a, um, a burden on, on uh, the operator and on the national authority as well. Uh, facilitating the implementation of more effective and efficient safeguards. Um, making possible the use of unannounced inspection and short notice random inspections. Uh, this is something that will probably impact the decision making level, the state level, more than the, state, the, the SSAC level, which is you know, allowing uh, 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 these types of inspections to take place. Um, unattended, and, and in most cases, the types of inspections and the number of these inspections are documented in the safeguards agreements that these um, countries have with the IEA in the subsidiary arrangements and specifically in each facility attachment. Uh, changing that takes a tremendous amount of coordination not only within the state, which has to go to change all that agreement uh, or, and documentation that is already in place, uh, but also communicating that, coordinating that with the IEA. So these may seem simple when we list, or say, oh, it's obvious that we can make use of unannounced inspections, short notice inspections, but all of these are documented and usually, and in, in a hundred percent of the cases, I would say, they are, uh, um, they are documented and, and, and any changes takes a tremendous amount of negotiation and discussion again. Um, unattended and remote monitoring systems. This is a, this is a topic that is quite easily uh, um, uh, implemented, I would say, compared to the others. <laughs> Uh, because it's, it's the, 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 the coordination level is mostly between the operator, the national authority, uh, in understanding where to put these systems and, 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 and the men benefit of, of doing continuity of knowledge using remote monitoring systems to minimize the number of, of inspections. So that would be something that would be um, in this uh, framework here, one of the easiest implemented uh, measures. Uh, using joint use of equipment. Um, the, the safeguards agreements, uh, they establish that uh, the IEA will take into account the findings of the, uh, safe, the state system or of the regional system. And therefore, uh, the joint use of equipment is something that they really look Toward, uh, forward to. Um, that minimizes, of course, the, um, the need to buy two pieces of equipment. Um, that also minimizes the, the space where you're going to, to keep that equipment. Uh, the important thing is not the hardware itself. The important thing is the ability that the, each organization has to uh, have to, to um, come to their independent conclusions. If one equipment can provide that, fee that, that information uh, and they can be drawn, uh, their conclusions can be drawn independently, then we should promote the joint use of equipment. Uh, and also uh, implement safeguards by design for new or modified facilities. Uh, this is another a uh, topic that we've been uh, discussing quite a lot. Uh, and, and basically, there are a number, um, the majority of the facilities of countries that became members of the NPT uh, in the early 90s or mid 90s are facilities that were built before uh, the, any concepts of, of comprehensive safeguards agreements was even, you know, uh, negotiated. 
So the design of these facilities are not what we call safeguards friendly. Uh, in most cases, uh, you have uh, measurement issues that need to be addressed, like an equipment cannot reach a certain point where it needs to be uh, uh, measuring that, that the material. So safeguards by design has become a, a very important feature in um, the, the collaboration between state and the IAEA. Uh, for the new facilities, this is coming uh, on a natural, um, um, as part of the discussions uh, of, of how to implement safeguards in that facility. But for the old ones, uh, and, and uh, especially power reactors, for example, um, some, some spent fuel ponds are not safeguards friendly in terms of measuring uh, 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 spent fuel. So th this is something that would also benefit the, co the cooperation and strengthening the coordination between the IEA and, and the state. The understanding and facilitating these adjustments on the design of the facility, which is a lot of work for those facilities that already exist. I mean, how are you going to change the design? So what you do is to adjust a technology to measure that facility. And that's where we come to the field trial again. So, you know, all of this is linked together. So here are the thing, the, the, the line that needs to be strengthened. So the operator talks to the SSAC, who talks to the IEA. And then the IEA talks to the SSAC, who talks to the operator. Uh, in the regional system, you have operator, SSAC, and regional system between the SSAC and the IEA. Um, and actually, between the SSAC, there's, the SSAC would talk to the operator and then report to the RSSAC. Um, it seems like one more step but as I explained before, in terms of coordination, the fact that these organ, uh, uh, regional systems are located in the region makes a lot of difference in, in, in strengthening communication. And this is my last slide. It actually, I, 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 um, I, took, the, uh, uh, I took it from a presentation by um, the former chair of the Standing Advisory group on safeguards implementation uh, of the agency. And it's a very simple uh, uh, diagram which shows that the core is the responsibility of the state systems of accounting and control. And we talked about the license of, of possession and use of nuclear material, the accounting of nuclear material system, nuclear security, expert control of both nuclear material and technology, and investigation of unauthorized nuclear materials and activities. All of these are responsibilities of the core, which is the SSAC uh, regulatory functions. Now, it expands as we increase its role to the interface with the IEA. So the SSAC is the primary, primary con point of contact with the IEA. It has to provide uh, reports on a timely and accurate basis. Uh, it facilitates inspections and complementary access. It resolves issues. That, that's where, that's the, 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 the only communication that the IEA has with the state is to, uh, with, with the, with, to, to resolve issues, is to talk to the SSAC and, and explain what the problems are. And the SSAC obligation is to resolve these uh, on a timely basis. Uh, matter, and also provide other relevant information such as nuclear trade and etc. Uh, we also talked to, uh, about the issues involving this additional uh, information. Um, beyond that, on the outside ring, and I, this slide also pulls together my previous presentation of how the core technical responsibilities also has an impact in the policy uh, of, of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. So we talked previously about the uh, Security Council Resolution 1540. Uh, we talked about the NPT. 
uh, other treaties and conventions and also bilateral agreements and obligations such as the ones uh, between a state system and its regional system. All of this falls into place as far as how important the state system of accounting and control is in today's international safeguards reality. Uh, the more transparent, the more friendly uh, uh, um, relation of the state system of accounting and control, the more information it provides, the more uh, um, uh, willing to welcome new experiments, new technologies. All of this is complicated to implement. It's not easy. You know, I've, I've I've, in my international collaboration world, which is what I work with, uh, it's, it's very complicated or at least uh, time consuming to arrange a, a field trial in a facility. Uh, when you put together all of these ideal situations, provision of additional information, uh, the first question that comes in, why am I going to give more information what is the agency going to do with that information? What will, what will be the big assessment of that? Those are questions that you can't help, you know, to think about them. Um, the same thing, I mean, why am I going to stop my production to allow five individuals with their instruments and cables and God knows what else to come into my facility to test a measurement system. What, what will I lose in terms of money in production time and, product, and, and product? So it's easily said than done, uh, but it's possible if there is goodwill. And I think that this is what we should be pushing towards to uh, enhance this collaboration, to make this uh, communication channel as fluid as possible. So this is what I have to present. Um, I try to give not only my, my, uh, my personal uh, thoughts on this, but, uh, but also what's being discussed. These are the, 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 the issues that are being discussed uh, currently uh, by the IEA and its member states. So thank you, I'm open for any questions if you have.